Hello, and welcome to the You're an Asset podcast. I'm your host, Casey the Dollar. And on this podcast, we find out who is an asset in the financial industry and who is just an ass. It is. The BMIs are stupid. Thanks for joining me, everybody. On today's episode, I have a very, very special guest. I am planning to learn so much on today's episode, so you should be prepared to learn a ton as well. I'm so excited to have this person here. I'm pretty sure he's going to be an asset, but we don't know because guess what? We have never talked before offline. This will be the first time that we've ever gotten to chat. And so without further ado, please welcome... Mr. Jeremiah Dew from The Banking Bros. What's up, everybody? Casey, the dollar. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to be here. Yeah, we've only had a few DMs back and forth, but it's great to see you in this venue here for everybody to, you know, fact check what happens now that you've recorded our first real conversation. We'll see. Yes, there's no hidden conversations. We don't know what's going to happen today. And I think it's more fun this way. So I'd love to know just how long you've had your license. When did you start the Banking Bros? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for having me once again. My journey started specifically in this category when about nine years ago, somebody said, hey, permanent life insurance and especially whole life, the one I like the most, works like this. And I said, time out, because he was using these terms like wealth, financial freedom and leverage. And I'm talking, hold on, you just said life insurance. What does that have to do with wealth? Like life insurance means you die. And I was a Dave Ramsey fan. I was paying cash for everything, Casey. I was out of debt. I got out of debt using his plan. I have no debt. And he's talking about we're going to leverage life. And I'm saying, hold on. First, you have to die to be wealthy. I'm a little lost there. And second, Dave Ramsey said I was going to go to hell if I used whole life insurance. So now I have to die and go to hell. Um, all right, I'm in. I'm in. No, I didn't I'm say in. it right then, but <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Look, if this is what white folks are doing, we're going to have to sell our souls. That's what I told my brother. Like that. I knew it this whole time. That's what you got to do. So no, it didn't really happen like that, but somebody introduced us to these terms that we see on the internet now, if you're on TikTok, insurance talk or whatever, infinite banking. I was lost. Mm -hmm. They didn't even explain that actually at the beginning. I heard it as fractional banking. We're going to make 40% on our money. Weird, crazy stuff. But it was a redneck. I live in South Carolina. So you can't trust everybody who's talking to you, even if they've got a hundred mobile homes as property. So we have been helping people do what we do specifically now that you're hopefully engaged, but lost. Like what do they do? <laughs> We've been helping people do it for six years now. I've wow. been practicing what I preach for coming up on nine and we've been helping other people for six. The banking bros focus specialize in traditional whole life insurance. Now, I specialize in index universal life insurance, but I am familiar with whole life products. I think that both have very specific uses. I don't know if you want to give me like a basic rundown of how you view whole life in comparison to IUL. Yeah, I'll come at it from a place of how I came in to understand whole life insurance. And then when all of this stuff on social media and blogs and video started to come out, around the indexed universal life product and IUL, I did not know. And I was like, wait a minute, what are we talking about? These two things, are they the same? Are they different? IUL has a lot more love than whole life insurance, first off. So if you're out there scrolling and looking, you're going to see IUL 10 times more often than whole life. Why is that? And what is being said about it? And what are those differences? When you give an insurance company money, you're transferring the risk of the loss of something to them. So let's say we've got car insurance, phone insurance, and fire insurance. We give them some dollars. Jacob State Farm, Flow It Pro. All right. So we got (laughs) Jacob State. I'm looking at me. I'm Jacob State. And look at Casey. She's Flow It Pro. When we give an insurance company dollars, they are on the hook now for the loss of the product or property. That's the point of insurance. Now, there's a difference in life insurance. We're talking about life insurance. Casey is talking about life insurance. I'm talking about life insurance. The difference there is that we have to die in phone, fire, jewelry, and all those other properties. We hope there's never a loss. We just don't want to be on the hook if there is a loss. 
Mm -hmm. So we give that loss risk and transfer that to someone else. In life, there will be a loss. And a lot of, a lot of times out there, depending on who you're talking to, you say, hey, if something happens to you, if some, there's something going to happen to you. You're going to die. It's happening. Uh, I mean, we can't get out of here alive. It's inevitable. It's happening. Yep. And whole life insurance is 200 years old. It works every time. We give in a dollar to the insurance company. They declare, based on the property, the life, how much money they're on the hook for. But it must pay no matter what. It's a unilateral contract we're dealing with. So if we give them money, as long as we stay alive, they must pay. That's it. The other 100 pages of that contract are what they have to do because we've now got the contract. So our mortgages are not so different. We only pay the mortgage premium today. They let you live in all the house. And then every time you pay, you've <laughs> yeah. got more equity. And we can leverage that equity, except the owner of this contract in life insurance is you. You have the permission to be able to leverage those dollars. You're borrowing against the value of your policy. You're borrowing against it. Your policy is collateral, but it's guaranteed. Cannot go down, cannot go backward, cannot lose to the market, must go up, income tax for use, and must keep going no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened to me. After I'm practicing this for a while, I start to see folks like you and others talk about another product. And I was lost. Is there really a better product? What's the differences and things like that? So that started my journey of trying to understand the differences between the two products. But yes, I am a whole life guy utilizing something that's guaranteed to grow in cash flow, as we said. It has to. doesn't matter. No matter what. You're contractually locked in. And so is the insurance company. The risk is on them the whole time. Do you feel like you've said anything right now that doesn't apply to the IUL? Oh, I know that I have. All oh, right. Like we, I know that I have. Okay. So guaranteed to grow in cash flow. Your IUL is not guaranteed to grow and cash flow no matter what happens for the rest of your whole life. That's not how it works. As in you're saying there's no guarantees whatsoever. Good question. Good question. So that is a very fair thing to say. So let's nuance it. That's what we're on this conversation yeah. to make sure we yeah. understand. So guaranteed to grow and cash flow for the rest yeah. of your whole life is not what an IUL says. Whole life insurance is that the dollars you give them are guaranteed to pay out as the death benefit, no matter what happens. It must do that as long as you pay the premium. Another yeah. guarantee is that your dollars cannot lose any market value. They're not in the market. Okay. So your dollars don't fluctuate or anything like that. They all stay there. Mm -hmm. The dollars that you give the insurance company can't go down, can't go backward. They stay there. They compound and grow no matter what happens for your whole life. The third guarantee is that the premium is level. It's locked. It's fixed. The cost of insurance cannot change, cannot go up, cannot go down. You are contractually able to give that same premium amount over and over, and they've got to multiply it. It's guaranteed. It happens. So the nuances between that and IUL is that there is not a guarantee. The only one that's different, two of them are fine with IUL so far, the way I explain things. One of them is that the r cost of insurance is not a fixed number in IUL. Right. So that number must age on a chassis called annual renewable term. And as Casey and I get closer and closer to our mortality, it costs the insurance more money to guarantee they'll pay the benefit. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the risk is getting higher. Yep. But in whole life insurance, the risk never changes. The risk actually gets lower the entire time. So the policy becomes more efficient because they already declared they must pay it out no matter what happens. Indexed universal life is not built on a chassis of fixed costs. 100% agree with this. I've said before, you know, the di for me, the differences of whole life and IUL, the whole life policy has guarantees. The IUL does not. And the only thing I was going to say is, have you seen a, an IUL or you know that they do, you're guaranteed 2% per year? Well, sure. Now, your whole life yeah. insurance guaranteed bottom number, depending on your company, all that can be two. So first off, let's just be fair. It can be two, 100%. We can be fair to that. But the point is, is that the cost of the insurance never changes. IUL has a different chassis. So no mm -hmm. matter what, your mortality is getting more expensive for the insurance company to risk on. So we've got to kind of think about why people would buy insurance and what they would use it for. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying anything's wrong with the product. 
But there's a lot of people, as you call out all the time, who are saying things about the product or making the product do things or not do things that they said they were going to do for you or something. The reason that a lot of people are buying IUL, not the only reason, and I know that you help people um, be able to leverage them early, but if you're buying an, a life insurance policy that you can potentially utilize in retirement, mm-hmm. we're going to have to assume that retirement's a couple years down the road. So it's a couple of years down the road, a couple of decades down the road. Well, the cost of keeping the policy is rising. Mm. And in the event that the performance of the cash values or surrenders are not able to cover the rising costs, Mm -hmm. then the insurance company will automatically take that money and pay for the death benefit. So we have to understand some, yes, a lot of people, uh, you know that of course, a lot of people don't. Uh, I know that. So here's what happens. As you rise in age, aka retirement, the cost of it is rising. You're going to have to make sure you don't live too long because the cost is going to go up. And Mm. so if you live too long, which is probably what you're telling me on the phone you want to do, then you've got (laughs) to realize you're competing with the cost of the product while you're pulling money out of it at a loan which obviously has a cost as well. Would you say that the rising cost of the IUL and the, the idea that it's not guaranteed to pay out a death benefit is your two biggest problems with the IUL? Well, it depends. It depends on what you want to use it for. And that's what you've said as well. So it's like term. Do I have a problem with term? I don't. No. But do you think it's valuable for everyone? Yeah. I mean, I mean if you're going to yeah. die early, I don't want to die early. But if I'm going to die as soon as we get off of this podcast, then term would then have I been better the way have to a go. term policy. Set <laughs> yeah. Up. It would have been yeah. the way to go. So yeah. the thing is, we're in, in whole life insurance, we are guaranteed to be able to play the long game. And the insurance company partners with us for that long game, no mm-hmm. matter what. None mm-hmm. of the risk gets transferred back to us. And in IUL, it does. The insurance company starts to offset some of their risk and give it back to the person. But isn't that the opposite of what insurance is supposed to be for me and you in our mind? It's a, it's a very interesting way to think about it, right? You shouldn't have to be fighting the product to get the benefits out of it. I think you're going to be really surprised at the cost of the IUL that I set up for you. I think okay. you're going to be okay. really surprised. There's two things I'm I'm wondering about. The first one is... When you're setting up a whole life policy for someone and they want it for retirement, are you doing this with a whole life policy, showing them how much money they can take out at 65, whatever it is, 70 for the rest of their life? Great question. So no. So one thing about many people in the whole life space, it's not that you can't do that. So let me just say that first off, I could 100%. But what we're teaching people is the use of the dollars. The dollars can be utilized. We've got to remember that an IUL is going to be shown to us on paper. We're going to see dollar amounts rise based on something that is never going to happen, like the, do- like the paper shows. In whole life insurance, no matter what happens, we are going to be shown the net cash no matter what happens, and it's always rising. That is not what you're seeing in an IUL. You're seeing how they would be real if the market ever performed that way. But in whole life, all the cost fees are taken out of it. We see the net increase in cash minimum, no matter what happens. I see the net minus fees in the illustration as well. I'm not quite sure what year. Based on an index that would never perform like that. So we're seeing an index. It's the S&P 500. You're talking about averages. Not yeah. actual. In 2020, yeah. the market was down. Yes. Okay. But the IULs, they don't show you that. They show you whatever it was illustrated as. The average might be the number, but the dollar amount is what I can spend. I can't spend averages. I can spend the dollars that we're truthful about mm-hmm. that. The average is not actual. It just doesn't yeah, happen. Yeah, so I know have, this. I've done content yeah. that's the average versus the actual three years right. ago. It is a hypothetical projection. Sure. 100%. So let me ask you a couple of questions about how do you help people, if you do, how do you help them understand future variations from the company in cap spread and participation rates on future index performance that we don't know? As in, how do I help them understand what will ultimately be there even if the indexes don't perform? Yes. Yeah. So on one of the illustrations that I sent you, the 
the projection page has guaranteed, yep. midpoint, and non-guaranteed. Yep. So when I show them those three columns, there are certain numbers in those three columns that are actually exactly the same. They're guaranteed. Okay. Let's say that if I say, okay, this is the guaranteed column. This is based on a 5% return. We are hoping to be over here, but you should look at this number. This is ultimately your worst case scenario because it is the guaranteed okay, right. 2% per year, right? So we're hoping Got to it. be in between here, but I'm running the number so low at 5%. It's about controlling expectations 100%. Um, saying your worst case scenario over here versus hopefully my 5% is not the best case scenario. When I run yeah, sure. a 5% average, I mean, IULs do average 7% long term. So if I'm showing a 5%, I'm still going under the average of the product since it's been alive since 1997. Well, yes. So I, and I agree with that. And I know those things. So I would love for you, yeah. I know we're going to get into the, some of that paperwork here uh, in a yeah. second. So that'd be helpful for me. My question now is going to be, how would you mm -hmm. account for the underperformance of any piece of paper since that time. So once again, it's the difference between illustrated values, averages, and actual mm -hmm. cash. If the IUL is not set up to have the minimum amount of death benefit, you have max contribution limits. If your sure, max yeah. contribution is six grand a year, you're never going to be able to pay more than six grand a year. So your premium is never going to go up. But if you've been paying six grand a year and your policy would allow you to contribute twenty five thousand dollars a year and you're yep. wondering 20 years from now why you don't have a cash value and why your policy is going to lapse because it was shit to begin with. I, there's no way for me to say that agents in 2009, 2010 were doing a good or bad job. I don't know. And it sounds like most were not doing a good job. Right. Because people are getting screwed. The interesting thing that I would say about that, because you and I are ingredients on that. Yeah. There is a very poor way to illustrate what is going to happen. Yes. So here's my question now is yeah. if there is a guarantee, no matter how bad and you set it up in the worst way possible, yeah. it still never underperforms the whole life policy. It's guaranteed. You're going to see I mean, the you're, it's guaranteed no that what. a death <laughs> right. benefit is going to pay out. It is not guaranteed that that person has a hundred grand to leverage. It is not guaranteed oh, no, I, that they no, have no, an no, no, income. No. But, the, but I, just, I just want it to be clear, right? Correct. It's guaranteed that a 100%. death benefit is going to pay out. That's it. Yes, but I'm not here to say anything about the cash value on that. I'm just saying no matter what happens, it's never going to lapse. The cost never changes. Participation spread is, is in, yeah. non-existent. And cash value will increase. And it doesn't matter if it's $1 or a million dollars, but it will never underperform. It can't. It's a guaranteed I contract. And there's always going to be payout. And yeah, loud cash and clear. will grow Understood. at whatever. Yeah. What, cash yeah. will grow at whatever cash grows. But it'll always yeah. do that. I don't want that risk in insurance. I'll go invest sure. elsewhere. I think, should we go through the numbers? Let's do should it. We, let's do let's it. Let's do it. Yeah. So just so everyone understands what we're going to do here. I have drawn up illustrations for him, his age, his state, based on $1,000 a month. So we have standard health rating, just standard okay. non-tobacco. Come on um, now. Standard, Casey, look at this body right here. Standard. Look at this. Yeah. I don't show anyone standard. I, don't, I mean, um, preferred plus or preferred. I don't okay. care if they tell me they're the healthiest person in the world. I'm going to show you standard. Okay. This, was, this is first thing that I do to not overpromise. Like it. Okay. Um, okay. Let the insurance company tell me they're in good health. And then, wow, look at cost of insurance is less. Now, there are four things inside this policy. There's something called the death benefit protection, which I want to talk, talk to you about. But then living benefits. Okay. This was something I wanted to compare to whole life as well. The, this policy is going to have a critical, chronic, and terminal illness rider included with the policy. And then we have the mm -hmm. cash value accumulation and the distribution. Now, the living benefits... You can see that a critical illness at age 60 would pay out a lump sum of 37000 This is a first, the first part where I would say these are hypothetical numbers. These are hypothetical yes. based on sure. the value of your policy, You know, yeah. if you've taken loans, whatnot. But now the next page on page five, there's something called the death benefit protection. This is unique to this company. And all it is is an escape route, a way to cancel the policy, not pay a penalty, not pay any taxes, no surrender charges and leave behind a death benefit. So if you see the 175, the 175,000 would be a death benefit at 65 years old, 
your policy is canceled, you're given a lump sum of $446,000 tax and penalty free. Well, what does it do? What is it? At age 65, you yeah. have the option to cancel your policy, reserve a portion of the death benefit to be given to your beneficiary, and walk away with the remaining value of the policy tax and penalty free, but only Got at it. age 65. Got it. Or, or after or just at 65? After 65, if you start taking loans from the policy, then you cannot yeah. use this. If you don't okay. take loans, this would be available for you to cancel. Okay. Now, if yep. you start Got taking it. loans, there's something called an overloan protection rider. So if you yeah. overloan money to yourself, you pull out too much money, your policy will not lapse. They're going to keep it in force. They won't allow you to borrow any more money, but they're going to guarantee yeah. the death benefit over your head. Because it does say guarantee is the death benefit coverage, even if you've technically lapsed your policy. 10 four. Now, I want to scroll down to page eight. These are the indexes. So okay. I have allocated the money into four different places. There are statistics that say if we diversify into at least three different indexes, our chances of having a 0% year are only 5%. So I want to use this yep. statistic. I want to diversify. First index I have is the S&P 500. It has a 9.5% cap. Now, because we've talked about fluctuations of cap rates, I just want to let you know that three and a half years ago when I started working with this company, the cap rate was 9.5%. It still is. Yep. Now, the participation rate's 100%. I have put 30% of all of the money there. The next the next index is called yeah, the Fidelity Index. This is one of these newer indexes. It's um, on high par Fidelity. Now, the Fidelity Index has been around for four years. I tell this to my clients. I say, hey, this is a newer index. It does have a higher participation rate of 210%. It is subject to change, of course. But for now, if we want to take advantage of it, even if this index returns 1%, we're going to get credited 2.1. I put 20% of the money there, a small chunk. The next one is another S&P 500, but with spread, it doesn't have a cap. The spread rate 7.5, participation rate's 100. So everything over 7.5%, we're going to earn. This strategy says that, okay, everything up to 9.5 from the S&P, we're going to earn. And then everything over 7.5. So I've diversified them in the S&P all the way up to the cap and then pass the baton to the spread index to catch everything else. Now, that is only 70% of the money. 70% of the money is allocated to the S&P and the Fidelity Index. The remaining 30% is allocated to the fixed account. This fixed account is earning 3%. Yep. What do you think about that? So first off, I do like that you're explaining to people where you're putting the money and why. And obviously you're being transparent about those things. That's great. Are you helping people to understand that this is a, is a one year of course. investment strategy and that do you 100%. go back and review it, I guess? Okay. The gotcha. Power three financial acts as a resource for annual reviews. We okay. let people know ahead of time. Listen, this is a recommendation for this year. How do you feel about it? Do you want to talk about all the other indexes? Obviously, this is only one carrier, right? So we'll look at another carrier, talk about sure. their indexes. And then that's first conversation. These get to change. We get to reevaluate every single right. year and change them. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good with that. Now, the next part is yeah. the historical changes, right? Okay. We could go over those or we can go straight to page 12 of 31. We have our guaranteed, non-guaranteed alternate, and then the non-guaranteed assumed. So your yeah. guaranteed column, minimum account value, 2%, right? That is our guarantee over there. Yeah. Um, that's that. the first column. Your midpoint is a 3% annual return. Now, the non-guaranteed assumed is showing 5.9% on 70% of the money and 3% on 30% of the money. It's showing yep. my allocations. Yep. Now, I'm using a death benefit option called return of premium. I have the minimum death benefit here of 175000 Return of premium means that if you're contributing twelve grand for the year, all twelve grand is going to be added to your death benefit. And you can see that in the guaranteed column all the way to the non-guaranteed assumed. So if you say $175,035 and $35 plus twelve grand, that's $187,035. Same thing. After 10 years, you contribute 120000 That's $295,000 of death benefit. You can see that in all three columns. So if, you're, if you were to pass away within those first 10 years, even, your beneficiary is going to get the initial death benefit you purchased and every single dollar that you contributed. Guaranteed. Indeed. Now, 
The IUL only has about 50% liquidity on year one. And this is taking the yep. cost of insurance out, but also adding in any interest earned. So there's your first point where this is showing the interest, of course. So this is hypothetical, right? Um, sure. A portion right. of it is earning 3%. But so 120 grand went in. If we look at the first column, guaranteed 102,000. 102,000. We go over to the midpoint. The far column says 125,000. If we go all the way to the year 27, okay. the total contributions, yep. 312,000. You're going to see that your guaranteed and your non guaranteed columns, that is when they are gone, right? They start doing yeah. zeros because I have pulled out 54,000 per year starting at age 65 for the rest of the person's life, right? So now yeah. your guaranteed column ends. It says you got out 216,000 and then the policy would have lapsed, right? However, we just went over the loan, over loan protection rider. So if they did pull out that money, Death benefit's still going to be guaranteed. There's going to be a guaranteed death benefit using the overloan protection rider. Um, it's not going to be it's not going to be a large amount, right? It's going to be a small amount, and the policy is going to have to keep working and compounding on itself and earning interest. Same thing with your midpoint, right? You took out a certain amount of money and then it crashed. That's your far column, right? Of course, hypothetical based on the interest the um, indexes that I'm using. What my standard is over there is I will not let that net cash surrender value drop below a hundred thousand dollars right okay. i'm not going to drain that account so if you scroll all the way to age 89 age 90 you're going to see that there's still over six figures in that net cash surrender value again yep. me trying to say hey listen it's hypothetical i'm not going to drain the account i want to leave money in there because we are going to need a buffer we need to be realistic right? About this 54,000, we need to be realistic about the 5.9. And so I'm not going to drain the account. I'm not going to show this. And we're going to we're gonna talk about how it goes down and why there's zeros in the other two columns. Questions for me, Jadu, what are you thinking looking at this? Yeah. So thank you for that. Obviously, I've seen lots of IULs. Yes, most of what I've seen by far is not set up this well at all, first off. Second, uh, one or two questions. When we start taking uh, distributions in year 27, I'm 65 or so. Yeah. We start taking distributions, great, and then, but this is one of the major things that I might point out to someone. Yeah. Are we, so based on the minimum guaranteed column, did our policy lapse when I was in the 31st year, when I was 70? The overloan protection rider would have kicked in, but yes, you would not be able to loan any more money. Got it. So I would still be guaranteed the one, am I still guaranteed the 175 or no? Correct. They would stop yeah. you from loaning money, yeah. keep your policy where it's at, and allow it to keep compounding interest, right? So it's going to keep growing. They're not going to allow you to touch it because you owe, took too right. much. And now right. they want their money, right? So yeah. all that interest right. you earned in the future, it's going to go to the insurance carrier so that you do get something when you pass away for your beneficiary. Got it. Okay. So g good. Well, that, that right there is... Knowing that that's the guarantee, once again, in my mind, I'm always looking at the guarantees yeah. and what has to happen, worst case scenario. I was just trying to make sure if all hell breaks loose and yeah. I needed this money and actually took it and whatever. So if I make it, obviously, that far, 65 years old, 175 is still coming out because they would stop me from being able to utilize the policy at that point if I took all the money. It's great to know. Yeah. No, amazing. But I want you to go all the way to the bottom to... Uh... The literally the last page, page 30 of 31. What you're going to see here, this illustration is not a mech. And your minimum no lapse premium for the year is less than 1500 Your max yep. contribution is 12005 cents. This policy cannot take any more money yep. than what I'm showing. On year eight, the guideline level annual premium raised up to $12,434. So woohoo, you got an extra $400 of room starting year eight per year yeah. in your policy. Okay. If you never mm -hmm. put that money in, it's not going to make a difference. This policy is fully funded. You're never going to be asked to pay more than what I'm showing. But your goal amount, the target premium is $3,428, so a little bit less than $3,500 per year. That is the goal. If you only pay $3,500 into this policy, you'll keep all of your benefits, right? The uh, yep. You'll get to age 65. You can use the overloan protection rider. You could cancel the policy, reserve the original death benefit, walk away with your cash. They'll never ask you for more money as long as you pay the 3500 
my client wants to pay 12 grand, right? Right, right? So they have so much flexibility. I don't feel concerned at all that they're going to miss their premium, be tight on funds or anything like this, right? Because they have told me 12,000 is where I'm comfortable. If anything, I might want to put more, right? But I'm going to say, right. you would need to know this ahead of time. If you want to put more, sure. I'm not just going to give you more room because you might. That's me not doing a good job because I know the risk of making the policy too big, right? So these guidelines are extremely important. Have you ever seen guidelines look like that according to the illustration to say, look, that is max funded. I mean, this is my standard right there. That's a great question because no, I have seen many things that you would probably bark at and you probably talk about all the time. And I don't <laughs> think that I have seen a universal life product connected to the index. I don't think that I've seen one built with this many fail safes on what could go wrong. And I say wrong kind of in quotes because of course we yeah. might take loans. So yeah. Um, of course, we don't know. We don't know what the don't person know. will do, but yeah. Of but course. we do know that there are some guardrails on how this yeah. company handles them. So I am impressed on that front. Amazing. Even if you're a little bit impressed, I'm. I'm really. <laughs> even if you, because that's that's my point. How serious I am about how conservative and. How many fail safes I'm trying to put in here and that you really could take advantage of that people are just, they don't care. Well, that that's true. So I will say, based on every IUL that people send me, I know they send them to you, right? Hey, look at my policy, review it, or what's yeah. going on here? And they do it for me as well. I yeah. will say, if there were an IUL that I would take, it would be this one over anything that I've ever seen. So I, I yeah, I mean, of course, I understand what's going on and I see that your, I, I see how careful you have been and how vocal you are and why you're so vocal in the posts and things like that, that I get, get to look at because I don't normally yeah. see things built this well. And obviously you don't either. We see things that are really bad, whether or not it's good or bad. It, the question might be, what did you think it was going to do? What did you think as a client mm -hmm. that it was guaranteed or possible or how you could use it? So once again, what we're teaching yeah. people in the banking bros environment at the cash compound is how to utilize the thing. So the idea of retirement mm -hmm. and allocations or distributions and things like that is not what we're trying to help people understand. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with the retirement stuff. It's just not normally what I'm helping people yeah. understand. Uh, retirement is good. Cash, you yeah. need income, cash flow, boom. I love it. it that's just not normally what yeah. I'm telling people. You know, this is a retirement example yeah. and I, yeah. I knew... We only have so much time, of course. too, and I'm hopeful that I think that we, you and I can see now we're on the same team here. I think I still have one question. When we're utilizing, uh, you and I both, when we're utilizing insurance, if the point is to offset the risk and give it to someone else with guarantees and, in this case, cash flow for us, what is it that you're willing to potentially bring back as risk? And you have minimized that risk as best as you can explain and understand with the companies and carriers, with how you design the policy forthcoming. I think it's probably the best mitigation of risk I've ever seen on someone who does IULs. One question that I have is when we're taking those distributions, we mm -hmm. are accumulating a loan balance this whole time. Yes, of course. Yes. That company after year six, their fixed interest rate is one and a half percent and they credit back one and a half percent always. So years one through five, the fixed interest rate is 2.75. Okay. So you're always going to net a positive one and a half percent. That's what's going to compound on your policy. Yes. But by year six, you actually net zero. Gotcha. If you use a fixed interest rate. Now, of course, there's alternate loans, right? So that's yes. a big thing where, just like you said, if someone wants to do this, I am sitting down with them and teaching yeah. them about alternate loans first and when it's appropriate to use them and that you should be paying them back at some point, yeah. that interest is okay. compounding. Cool. Yeah. Very good to know. Uh, well, I appreciate what you're doing to help people understand the uh, benefits of utilizing permanent life insurance products. I have yeah. my opinion and so do you. Of you course. as well. Yeah. But um, we're, yeah. we're trying to help fight against things that people don't understand and inject yes. the opportunity for some guarantees as best we can in cash flow. I think that heart is there. So I understand. I understand why you're so mad at everybody else on half of your TikToks. Now I get it. Um, so <laughs> now you get it. Yeah. yeah. I really appreciate you being here. Yeah. I, you. I think that we do have the same goal and the 
the idea is that insurance is supposed to be safer, right. reliable, more consistent, right? And if it's not like that, why the hell are we talking right. about Right, why would you be using Because it? Yeah. it defeats the purpose, yeah. 100%. We agree. You know, I'm not sure who was being tested if they're an asset or not. I feel like it was me. <laughs> well, I have like, lots of questions, that's all. But I feel like I did a good show. I, I'm going to let you pass. <laughs> Ladies no. and gentlemen, I've decided Casey the dollar is an asset. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that because I'm a guest, but that's what we, we make. Okay. Hey, you have permission. No, my friend, you, you are an asset as well. I think I'm going to have to ask you to come okay. back so that we can talk again with this conversation kind of over and would love it because I, I would love to get the cups. There you go. Yeah. I'll walk through it with you. I'll help your people understand it. Happy to do it. Um, it, It's an honor to have you on the show, Jeremiah. I really appreciate it. You are absolutely an asset to the entire financial community. Thank and you. I look forward to getting to work with you and continue our relationship in the future. Just really quick, where can everyone find you online? If they want to get in contact with you, what's the best way? So you're going to find us at The Banking Bros. At The Banking Bros. Most often I go live there as well as do TikToks and The Cash Compound at The Cash Compound or SaveAndSpendSystem.com. SaveAndSpendSystem.com. Amazing. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This has been the You're an Asset podcast, where we find out who is an asset in the financial industry and who is just an ass. I'll see you next week. Bye. The You're an Asset podcast is not giving financial advice. We are not licensed financial advisors and our licensing is strictly in insurance products. The information that we talk about is specific to the products that we work with. We cannot guarantee that other agents will have the same product features that we discuss on the show.